All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna talk about airway resistance. It's gonna be a pretty simple, pretty straightforward, common sense kind of video. But let's go ahead and do it anyway, just to really make sense of this concept, because it is integral to the entire concept of the respiratory system. All right, so how do we first off, when we talk about airway resistance, we really need to define a formula that's gonna help us throughout this entire process. Okay, this formula is actually going to be specifically for flow, right, for gas flow. So we're gonna write here for flow, for gas flow. Here, we'll even be more specific, we'll put gas flow, since we're talking about gases for the respiratory system. All right, so gas flow is equal to, right? It's equal to the change in pressure over resistance, okay? So if gas flow is equal to the change in the pressure over the resistance. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to go ahead and explain how pressure changes the gas flow, and then we're gonna express how resistance changes the gas flow. First off, let's go ahead and just derive this mathematical formula and understand that, and then we'll explain those differences. So first off, let's go ahead and see how pressure affects gas flow. So in this one, let's determine the relationship between pressure, and I'm gonna put here flow, but understand that it is for gas flow, okay? So now, let's look at this actual relationship here. Think for a second, if I were to, let's say that this number remained constant, let's say that it was two, all right? And I have the pressure set at originally, I have it set at two, right? But then I switch it. So let's say I, ch I change this pressure and I increase the pressure. Well, if I increase the pressure, let's say I increase it to four, but I keep the resistance constant at two. What happened? Well, this was originally one and this went to two. So what happened? It went up by two. So in other words, we can understand that whenever pressure increases, gas flow increases. What happens if I decrease the pressure? So let's say, for example, that I make one more example, and I say, okay, this was two over two, this was four over two, let me drop this down to one. So what if it's one over two? Well, then it's a half. Well, then that went down a lot. That went down by a one, it went down to, it went down by a half. So whenever pressure decreases, oh, well, gas flow should also decrease as long as the resistance is remaining constant. So what's the relationship here? That pressure is directly proportional to flow. Any type of change in the pressure, increase in the pressure, increase the flow. Any decrease in the pressure, decrease the flow. Simple as that, right? We'll write that relationship down just for the heck of it. Increase in pressure, uh, it directly relates to an increase in flow. A decrease in pressure relates to a decrease in flow. Now let's do this for resistance. So let's rewrite this formula below here so we can have this in two separate. So this one's gonna be here. Since we're doing that, let's do it in a different color too. Here, we'll do this here. Gas flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance. Let's say that we take the example again and we make this, we keep this constant. Now we keep the pressure constant and we change the resistance. So let's say originally the resistance here, let's say it was originally two, all right? Then this would give you a whole number value of one. But then, let's say I switch it, and I want to change the resistance. Let's say I increase the resistance. I increase it to four. So now it's two over four, right? So if it's two over four, what is that? Well, you know that actually breaks, you know, it reduces down to one half. So then it went to one half. Oh, that's weird. So I went from one to one half whenever I increase the resistance. Okay, what if I decrease the resistance? What if instead of I make it two, I drop it down to one? So keep this constant and I make this one. Well then, okay, look at this one. This one's gonna give me two. So going here, I went down by a half, right? I went down by a half. But if I go to this one, I went up by two. Huh, so if I increase the resistance, what does that do to the flow? It decreased the flow. If I decrease the resistance, that increased the flow. Let's write that relationship down there. So what's the relationship they're saying here? That resistance is inversely proportional to the flow. And again, we're implying here that this is gas flow. So if I decrease the resistance, what is that going to do to the flow? It's going to increase the flow. They should be opposite, right? And then if I actually increase the resistance, what should that do to the flow? That should decrease the flow. Now let's explain how this happens in the body. So we know this relationship. This is pretty much the hinging point of this entire video. But really, what we want to understand is not just a formula. We want to understand what affects these things. Now, let's go ahead and do that. So first thing let's see here is how does pressure affect gas flow? Then after that, we'll look at resistance. Okay, if you guys watch the mechanics of breathing, this is gonna be really easy, really straightforward. 
I'm gonna take three alveoli here, and I'm gonna put different pressures in each one of these alveoli. But what I want you to remember first off is what is the pressure in the atmosphere? Because we're applying this to physiological pr principles, right? The pressure in the atmosphere, or the barometric pressure, right, is 760 millimeters of mercury, right? So if it's 760 millimeters of mercury, let's apply three different types of pressures in the alveoli. Let's put them in different colors too. So let's say this one is 760 millimeter mercury. Let's say that this one is 754 millimeters of mercury. And let's say that this last one up here is going to be 730 millimeters of mercury. Okay, if we look at these, they're all different, and it appears like it's actually decreasing as we're going up. It wasn't, it's just doing it just for the heck of it, right? Let's compare the difference between this one and this one. Okay, so we're gonna say that this is trying to be one pressure, so just for the sake of it, let's say that we're trying to look at the difference between these pressures. Let's say that this is the, let's say this is the final pressure, <clears throat> just for the heck of it. We'll call this P2, right? And we'll call this one P1, and again, this is P1, and this is P1. And you'll see why in a second, okay? When this flows, it's gonna, everything wants to flow. What is that, what is that diffusion principle? Diffusion principle, let's write this down because it's gonna be key. The diffusion principle says that things like to move from high pressure to areas of low pressure. This is the natural way that gases, in this case, are gonna to wanna to move. <clears throat> so, 760 to 760. Well, if I take the difference between that, so let's say I take this one, actually, so we can color coordinate this. Let's make this, each color, the same here. So in other words, let's make this one, we'll keep this one blue, we'll keep this one here, this maroonish color, and we'll keep this one here, this pink color, so that we can color coordinate and really get this point across. Okay, so I'm gonna take this pressure here and subtract it from this pressure here. I'm gonna do it with each, every single one below this here. So let's say I take the atmospheric pressure, my P2, I take 760 millimeter mercury, and I subtract 760, let's color coordinate, I'm sorry, 760 millimeter mercury. And this is going to be what? This is for in the alveoli, and this one here is in the atmosphere. If I take the difference between these two, what am I gonna get? It's obvious, you get zero. Okay, well then that means that there's gonna be no net flow. Because if I take that formula here, let's apply the formula here to the gas flow. We said that flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance. Well this is zero, nothing's gonna happen. Because if you have zero over something, the whole thing is gonna be zero. So there's gonna be no net flow, zero flow whatsoever. Okay, now let's take this next concept. Let's write 760 all the way down so I don't have to keep writing, rewriting it, okay? Because I'm, I'm lazy. All right, so let's do this last one here, and then we'll get back in the game here. Okay, so the next one was maroon, right? So now let's subtract that one. So 754 millimeters of mercury. And again, this is in the alveole. I'm going to put A. Well, with this equal, 760 minus 754 is 6 millimeters of mercury. Okay, before we do any type of calculation, let's do this last one. This last one is going to be 700 and 30 millimeters of mercury. And again, this is in the alveoli. And again, what will this give me? This will give me a 30 millimeter mercury difference. Let's put these into the flow formula and see how it changes. <clears throat> so now, if I apply this formula here, flow is equal to, then change in pressure over resistance. And then again, for this one, flow is equal to change in pressure over resistance. Which one had the greater pressure difference? This one did. It had a, ch a pressure change of 30. So if that's the case, if this one had a pressure change of 30, and this one had a pressure change of six, which one is more gas is gonna flow through? It's gonna flow through this one. So this one is gonna have the largest flow, and this one is gonna have the moderate amount of flow, okay? Moderate flow. And then what? 
this would have no flow. And if I were for the heck of it, do another alveoli where the actual pressure, let's pretend for a second, I made this 761. If I made this 761, where would the gases be flowing now? Now it would be flowing out of the lungs. So it would be in the reverse direction. So if you did that, then what would happen? It would be a reverse flow. Okay, so the flow would actually be flowing from the alveoli out into the atmosphere. We're not going to do that. I just want you to understand the principle. So what's the principle behind this whole formula, this flow principle? That, diffusion, high pressure to low pressure. That's the way things like to flow passively, all right? So if that's the case, if these are equal, it's going to produce no flow. If it's, you know, small, it's only going to produce a moderate amount of flow, right? Only a small pressure difference, moderate amount of flow. But if you have a really big pressure difference, you're going to have a significant amount of flow. Simple as that. Okay, that takes care of this principle. So this principle, done. Okay, now let's see how resistance is affecting this. Let's see how resistance is affecting this. So where is resistance really, you know, resistance is a, con is a tricky topic here. You don't know why, because let me actually write something here, because resistance is technically insignificant inside of the respiratory system. And there's really two reasons why. Okay, and remember the, the major non-elastic source of resistance, you know, to gas flow is, is friction. So that's one of the major non-elastic sources of resistance to gas flow is friction. So now, if the major non-elastic source of resistance to gas flow is friction, let me apply some concept before we, we see that. There's two reasons why resistance is very small or insignificant inside of the respiratory airways. So I'm going to mention these two reasons. One reason is that most of the actual bronchi in the lungs are large. So most of the conducting zone bronchi have a large diameter, have a large diameter. And we're going to see why that's significant here in a second. The third one, I'm sorry, the second one, is actually going to be if you take, you know whenever the lungs actually take the primary bronchi, it goes into the secondary and the tertiary, and it starts breaking out into smaller and smaller and smaller bronchioles. Well, bronchioles are really small diameter, but if you take the total cross-sectional area of all the bronchioles, they have a huge diameter. So the total cross-sectional area of bronchioles is huge, okay? So therefore, if they have a large cross-sectional area, a greater diameter if you take all the cross-sectional areas, then really there's very little resistance. And technically there is a third reason, and that's because when you hit the terminal bronchioles, it's all gas flow. But once you hit the respiratory bronchioles, so once you transition, from the terminal bronchioles into the respiratory bronchioles, gas flow stops. And then diffusion becomes the main driving force. And you'll see, if you guys actually watch the video on external and internal respiration, you'll get the point there. That the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar duct and the alveolar sac are so thin. They're only a single layer. So really there's no gas flow, it's just diffusion across the actual membrane from the blood to the actual alveoli or from the alveoli into the blood. Okay, now let's take this concept of what I said with resistance. Well, we said that whenever resistance decreases, it increases the flow. Whenever resistance increases, it decreases the flow. Let's take a look first at the decrease in resistance and how that changes the flow. So you know our bronchioles, I'm going to point at them here. Let's say here's a bronchi, just whatever, and here's your bronchioles. Let's just say here, you see that structure right there, that red structure? That's trying to represent the bronchial smooth muscle. Why am I mentioning that? Because the smooth muscle is responsible for doing the contraction, the relaxation. So when it contracts, it constricts the bronchi. If it dilates, it actually, I'm sorry, if it relaxes, it dilates the bronchi. So what can happen with this smooth muscle? Two things can happen. Let's say I take and I cut. I make a transverse cut here. Boom. I, I slice that thing and I take and I look at it like this. Okay? 
here's this bronchi, and let's say that I take and I make two other ones here. Actually, no, we'll come on, we'll give an example here. We'll put it like this, and we'll put it like this. Okay, here's the lumen. Here's where the air is actually flowing. Around this, what do we have surrounding it? This is all going to be smooth muscle cells. Okay, so all of this is smooth muscle cells. And let's say that for whatever reason, you need to be able to constrict the airway. Okay, you don't want as much air to flow. Well, if you don't want as much air to flow, what do we say was the principle? Okay, well, if there's actually going to be a decrease in flow, we would need to increase the resistance. Whereas, what do we say? We said if we want a lot of flow, we decrease the resistance. So let's do the first one. We said that we were going to do the first one, right? We we're going to talk about what could increase the flow. Let's say here's this actual smooth muscle cells. And let's say that you need to be able to get a lot of air in. You know your sympathetic nervous system? You have your sympathetic nervous system, and then you have what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. These have a direct influence on the smooth muscle, as well as other local inflammatory chemicals. If your sympathetic nervous system comes and stimulates this through adrenergic fibers, right? So it releases ad has adrenergic fibers, it releases chemicals like norepinephrine. You know what that's going to do? It might seem weird, but it's going to trigger dilation of the bronchioles. Okay? It's going to trigger dilation because you want more air to come in. Imagine running from a dog or something like that. Parasympathetic nervous system. It's going to release chemicals like acetylcholine onto different types of muscarinic receptors. You know what that's going to do? That's going to trigger constriction. So it's going to trigger constriction. Now, if the bronchi actually is going to, I'm sorry, if the bronchi dilates, so we're not going to draw all that smooth muscle again, but imagine here, if the bronchi dilates, what happens to the actual diameter? Well, the diameter is going to increase. So let's say here, this was the diameter here. Let's say that the diameter here was actually two meters, whatever. I know it's insane, but I'm just I'm giving you a number here. Obviously, that would never happen. That would be bad, all right? But let's say it changed here to about four meters. And let's say this one that got a lot smaller. So now the diameter here is a lot smaller, teeny tiny, right? Because it constricted. Let's say that it went down to uh, one meter. Okay, so if it decreased in size, if the diameter decreases here, what does that mean for the friction? What happens with the friction then? Because remember, the major non-elastic source of resistance to gas flow is friction. The friction here with the air running across these walls is going to increase. If there's increasing friction because of decreasing diameter. So decreasing diameter will increase the friction, and what do we say that will do? That'll increase the resistance. And if you increase the resistance, what does that do to the formula? Think about it, right? You increase this number, what does it do to this number? It decreases it. So flow should decrease. Simple. Exact opposite happens here. If you dilate this bronchial so that you can have more air coming in, well, there's not going to be a lot of friction between the actual inner, what's the uh, lumen here? Pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar, epithelial tissue, right? With this, you know, it's not going to have as much friction with that, and the air is not going to be running into one another as much. So the friction here will be decreasing. So if the friction is decreasing, it's because there is an increase in diameter. So then when there is an increase in diameter, what does it do to the friction? It decreases the friction. And what does that do to the actual resistance? It's going to decrease the resistance. Oh, man, that's beautiful. And what do we know about that? We know that if flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance, if you decrease the resistance, the flow will go up. All right. Why is this important, physiologically or pathologically? You know, certain people who actually have um, asthma or some type of allergic reaction to something, maybe they take in some type of allergen or whatever, or pollen, it can trigger these actual bronchial smooth muscles to really, really powerfully constrict. What would that do to the amount of air getting in then? They wouldn't get a lot of air in. So because of that, if they're not getting a lot of air in, what would happen to their breathing patterns? It would be very, very, very dangerously affected. So this stuff is not just insignificant to understand. It's really important because this thing right here is really, really and it's a serious, serious issue. If there is excessive constriction due to what? Not just due to the parasympathetic, but due to like some type of allergic 
reaction, which activates histamines. You know, histamines are responsible for being able to cause some of these problems. They constrict this so much, and then it causes so much resistance that if the flow decreases, what does that do to the breathing? The breathing becomes, is labored, and it becomes very hard to breathe, right? And that's one of the problems with this. And again, just wanted to provide a little bit of significance here of why this stuff is really important. All right, engineers, in this video, we covered, again, airway resistance. We talked a lot about it. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy it. If you did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and subscribe. As always, engineers, until next time.